Hey, this is Paul Martin. And Ray the Roadie. For the Rock and Roll Chicago podcast. How you been, Paul? I've been uh, pretty good. Pretty good. How about yourself, Ray? Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Been uh, been a little while since uh, we've been uh, putting anything out, but uh, we've both been kind of busy. A little vacationing, uh, some work stuff. Yeah, yeah. That happens, I guess. It's called life. That's called life. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So uh, we're, we're, we are back, people. We have not uh, forgotten about you. And uh, as a matter of fact, today we We've got a, we've got a uh, an interesting fella today. A really special guest, uh, Mr. Doc Julin. Uh, he's with uh, the Sunshine Boys, Expo seventy six. Uh, he's uh, used to be with the Slugs. Him and his brother Greg they uh, formed the band about nineteen eighty three. And he's also uh, one of the guitarists of Poy Dog Pondering. Yes, yes, he is, and uh, and also uh, a radio on the radio. Well, it was on the radio. It was on the radio. now on uh, Steve Dow's podcast. That's right. He's on Steve Dow's podcast uh, every day. Yes, yes, he is. Busy man, very busy man. Uh, so uh, l- let's get to it and uh, and see what the Dag has to say for himself. Sounds good. Let's go. Hey, this is Paul Martin and Ray the Roadie for the Rock and Roll Chicago podcast. So Paul and I are out today wandering around the Avondale neighborhood up in Chicago. We stopped into the uh, Demon Tap for a cocktail, and who's here but Doc Jewel? Wow. <laughs> Fancy <laughs> meeting you guys. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Who would ever known you were here? I've been driving, driving in from Woodstock for my nightly beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how's it going, Doc? Uh, it's going great. Thanks for... Uh, Thanks for waiting patiently for me this afternoon, and uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm glad we could get it together. No, it's great. It's great. Uh, you know, you're a busy guy. I mean, you've got a lot of stuff going on. And- yeah, I, 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 I uh, asked you guys to, to uh, we were looking for a time and a date and a, and a place, and I thought, well, I've got a studio session tonight just around the corner at Million Yen Studios, uh, my band Sunshine Boys. We're recording some strings for our upcoming album so i'm gonna check out i'm gonna head over there at, you know around six or something is that where you've recorded before or? uh just one session there before it's new to me we we um this is a studio that our producer matt allison is familiar with so he brought us over there it's a nice little room and it's it's going well so well let's start uh, talk to let's talk to us about sunshine boys first off. yeah it's a it's a it's a trio it's uh, myself i play guitar and sing and Jacqueline Schimmel, Jackie Schimmel, she plays bass, and she uh, she used to play with uh, Brad Elvis and Chloe and their band, A Big Hello, and she plays with a with a kids artist called Justin Roberts. Uh, she's been with him many years, and they've been nominated for a couple Grammys, but they've lost out, unfortunately, and uh, she now plays in this amazing kind of punk glam band called Tiny Bit of Giant's Blood, which is amazing, <laughs> and... Uh, and cool then, name. <laughs> very cool name, and it's everything that you'd expect from a name like that. Just yeah. kind of production and five foot high gold boots, silver boots. Uh, and yeah. it's a, it's it's good. It's very very over the top rock and roll with a with a, it's a stadium rock with with punk kind of hybrid, and it's really great. And um, so she's she's on bass, and I've known her for a long time. We've played together a lot of different situations. And uh, on drums is Frida Love Smith. She's uh, she's uh, she came out of a group called uh, the Blake Babies, who were a Boston group that that were um, uh, indie rock kind of uh, darlings. And, and uh, in the in the early '90s, Juliana Hatfield, a singer songwriter, was the kind of the, the singer in that band. And um, they had a lot of critical acclaim, made some amazing records, and actually. Uh, our band, The Slugs, uh, I, mean, I was in, and uh, we op- we opened up for the Blake Babies. I was a huge fan of theirs, and I just happened to to become friends with Frida, and 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 we um, the three of us were asked to back up some other people, uh, some songwriters for a project, and and I knew that the three of us were going to sound great on our own. So we did this thing, we did this gig, a couple of gigs with these guys, good friends of ours, and then they wanted to to sort of make it more of an official group and we were like, no, we're going to step away and form our own group. So that was in uh, 2016 and we put out a record last year and we're 
uh, really far along on our next record. So Blue Music. Blue, Blue Music, Music is the record, yeah. I like that. It's a, that's a great CD. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, very proud of it. We, we, we think we've got another, uh, an even better one cooking up right now. So we're, about, we're happy about that. Where'd the name come from? Sunshine Boys. Uh, well, it came from a conversation that I had with Frida when we were um, just kind of uh, realizing all the similar people, or uh, all the people that we knew, and all the places that we had played in our sort of previous '90s rock life, and we not, we weren't necessarily we didn't know each other, but we were. It just reminded me of a scene in the Sunshine Boys where the where Walter Matthau and, and um, uh, uh, George Burns are talking about all these old theaters they played, and I'm like, oh, this is it's like this is like a scene out of the Sunshine Boys, and if we ever form a group, let's. Call it that. Uh, so see, that's a, that's how it came to be, and also the fact that uh, two of the three members are women. Uh, that's called yeah. Sunshine Boys. I yeah. just and they were they they were They're okay with that. immediately. They yeah. did not question it. Yeah. So it was it just it just was a lot of our decisions have been effortless and 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 unanimous, and so that was just one of them. So it was never there was never. How about if we call it something else? You know, it's just right. that's just what it was. Now, so. do you do most of the writing, or, or, or I do, is it a combination of all three of you? I or? do the the songs are credited to all of us, but I do the writing of the songs. I submit the demos, and then once it's in their hands, then I really feel it becomes songs, and they uh, are excellent with editing and rearranging, and you know, adding bits, dropping bits. So I, I turn it over to them, and it becomes a group effort at that point. So. Now you said you were putting strings in there. Yeah, but 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 it's but you're obviously just bass guitar and drums. Yeah, when you play live. Yeah. So so how do you fill this fill in with the strings? Well, um, we've played a bu- all the songs that we're adding strings too. They've all been played live a bunch, and they were designed to play oh, I live. See. But when um, when we started talking about one of the, one of the songs on the record, we thought this would really be great if it had some strings on it. And I play in Poi Dog Pondering. Susan Vells is the string player there, and I asked her if she'd be interested in doing that, and she was. Uh, she said yes immediately, and so I sent her a song, and she loved it, wrote a great part for it, and and then she said, "Is there any any? Do you have anything else?" And we, the between the, the band, we couldn't couldn't decide on on two two songs. You know, we couldn't decide one of the two songs that we had thought of. So I sent her both. I said, pick what you want, whichever one you want. She she wrote another one, and then she said, I think I've got something for the third one. So I think we're going to oh, end up cool. with 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 strings. And so and then also another friend of ours who plays cello, um, uh, Anna Steinhoff, is going to be there there at the session too. So it's gonna it's gonna have a nice sound. And I, right. I I've never sort of been involved in recording strings before. I've never had it on any records that I've sort of done, and so I'm very excited about that. I've never never seen it. Being done, so right. it'll be cool, you know. It'll right. be cool. I, maybe they'll uh, overdub some stuff, so it'll sound more like a larger section or whatever. Are they, so, is it electric cello or? or? Uh, it's it's all. I think they probably each have pickups in their instruments, but right. that'll be recorded, you know, live with good mics right. and stuff. Yeah. You know, so very I'm excited. Cool. Yeah, very cool. Very excited. What, what's one of your favorite tunes off of uh, Blue, Blue Music? music um, right? That's the uh, the title track is is important to me. Blue Music. Um, it just is. It sums up a lot of. It's a, it's kind of a song for underdogs. I think it's kind of a song for the. the it's, it was a kind of a response to the the, the amount of um, music or, that exists currently, which is all sort of pointed and negative and um, um, does a bit of bragging and uh, uh, to the to the, at the expense of others. And I just thought that there was a. There was a. Uh, I couldn't relate to any of that. I couldn't relate to those sentiments. I couldn't relate to being talked at by music in that way. And I just sort of, I, I, I wanted to kind of celebrate all the instances where things have gone wrong. All the, all the, all the people who have not, who have, who have been, you know, afraid to try things or have watched other things pass them by. You know, so it was. It, it, and that, that, it's just a meaningful kind of message. For me personally, and that's what I, you know, I just think it, and the band I think sounds terrific on that. So. Here's to the ships that sailed, never to return. Here's to the plans that failed, and lessons never learned. Here's to the dreams derailed, and the stones that were left unturned. Here's to blue. Fairy tale that never could quite start, and to every threadbare sleep that's ever born a worn out heart. Here's to every Josephine. 
it was a, it was a song that it was sort of important enough to just name the record after, right. which is a which is a you know it's a it's a large task for a, a large weight for a song to carry if you're naming an album after right. it. So it's, you right. better be good title <laughs> song. So yeah. so that that's a, that's that's a song that I feel builds nicely. And, and you've got a show thing. coming up too, don't you? We have a few shows. We we tend to play in interesting little settings, but we're doing a show in a couple of weeks at a, um, a an art gallery in Evanston. So you can imagine oh, really? what kind of hell raising goes on at an art gallery <laughs> in Evanston. <laughs> but it's a it's a place that that's been hosting shows, and some of our friends have done shows there. And so we're going to do that show, and then the very next day. We're going to be shooting a video for one of our songs on the upcoming album. Oh, okay. So we're going to leave our gear there overnight, which is a, which is great yeah. for a lazy old rocker. And um, <laughs> and so then we're going to come back and we're going to shoot a video. Travel light is my matter. Travel yeah, light, I know. You know, a, nice, know. Little, a nice little lamp. A, I'm <laughs> telling you, man. Like I, it, it, no more marshals or nothing. <laughs> I had one of the one of the greatest rock moments I had was when I went into the Guitar Center in, in like Algonquin. And I wheeled in this four by twelve cabinet as a giant hundred watt <laughs> tube head, yeah. and I just traded it on the spot for a little Fender Blues Junior yeah, that nice. fits in the that's back of my yeah. back of my car. Like. And I was just like, I felt, I felt so like you feel I felt the weight off. Your I felt yeah. the weight, literally the weight, and I just felt, you know what, this is really what it's all about. You know, like yeah. it's sort of, and I, and in some symbolic way, I was like, all right. Sorry, giant stack. I yeah, guess we'll never play Alpine Valley, <laughs> but you'll find a good home somewhere. Even if you do, even if you do, can you use that blue shirt. Oh my God! I saw the Eagles. They had all just little combo amps yeah. on their stage. Yeah. So yeah, so yeah. No, that was a great moment. I saw a travel light when I bought my car. I brought all my gear with to make sure it would fit <laughs> in the <laughs> back nice. with the with the hatch nice. shut. So yeah, that's, that's that's how it is. So tell me about. Your history, how you got into music. Uh, originally, you started the Slugs with your brother. Yeah, um, that was a group that started, I guess, probably... I'd been in bands. Uh, I've always, I've, I've never not been in a band since 1978. And that's when, um, I, you know, I was pretty good at guitar in high school, and I hooked up with um, uh, some friends, and they asked me to join their band, and so I, you know, played that. And then when, when high school ended and everybody went their separate ways... Uh, my brother and I had a band for a little while with some co uh, junior college friends of mine, and when that ended, then we started the Slugs. So a, a friend of we we had um, we didn't have a drummer, but we had my brother Greg on bass and another guitar player called Al Paulson, Park Ridge, and we we had a job. We all had the same job that we didn't start till about three or four in the afternoon, so we had our days free to kind of mess around, and it was a really sweet little period where you're sort of living at home. And you're working, so you have a little bit of money, and you can you know, screw around in the day, essentially. So we did it. We formed a band, and we found our drummer, Mike Halston. And that started in 83, and that's when we started really kind of thinking about original music. There was I had to start writing for the band because, you know, you can't just play covers, you know. And so uh, I started... Not back then, anyway. Not back then. I mean, we... Yeah. we um, we started off doing covers, obviously, but sure. then at some point you realize you have to start writing. So I just, I never, had, wasn't much of a writer, but out of necessity. And I wasn't a singer. I never wanted to be the singer, but there was nobody else that knew the words or cared to do it. And I was maybe a ham in that regard. I didn't yeah. mind being at a microphone. So, um, and yeah, so that started in, in, I guess our first sort of meeting was maybe March of 83. And that, you know, we put out... We were slow moving. We put out maybe three records and, and had probably enough material for a couple more records, but it just didn't, you know, we never, we had some great shows and we had, a, you know, people that still talk about us and they were really kind to us. And, you know, we had some in, internal struggles in the band, just my brother and I, you know, that can be a weird, tough sure. relationship. Sure. And we, we've, we've since gotten it together very well. It's great, but... We don't play together anymore, and maybe I don't. There might be a connection. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> yeah, might be the so yeah. Did we, you guys sign with a label, or did you? Just, no, uh, we were sort of we when the, in the great sort of label, um, you know, feeding frenzy in Chicago about ninety two, ninety three. We just sort of held the door for everybody else who got through and got a record deal. Yeah. And we at that point we were probably old news. You know, we were a decade old as a band and. Um, you had put out a couple of singles, right? We, we had a couple singles, and by by 
by the early '90s, I think we had two records out, you know, two albums. Two albums. Yeah. Right. yeah. So I mean, we had some we had some good songs, some very legendary live shows. We had a very strong following. Um, certainly had no shortage of fun on stage. Um, he says, pulling on his beer. Um, <laughs> so we, you know, we, we we were a very spirited band, and we 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 weren't afraid to to kind of use humor when other bands were very serious, especially a lot of punk bands around town and stuff. So, and we didn't quite fit in with with the things that were happening. You know, we we played a kind of midwestern um, pop rock, um, and. Um, somewhere in between the who and the replacements and I don't know just things things never really kind of uh, escalated to a larger level for us and but we we uh, we had some how long did you stay together um technically I don't think we're broken up but uh <laughs> but we I think I think once once um once I sort of once I got asked to join Point Out Pondering in about 93 that sort of Created a, I'm not sure how to put it, but things. I don't think the other the, the other members of the Slugs were super happy about that. Right. Even, even yeah. though it helped, it, it did ultimately help people because Poi Dog fans are great, and they were they were like, oh, what's Dog's other band? And yeah, people started yeah. coming out to see yeah, us, yeah, and they liked right. us. So, um, so we kind of limped through the uh, the '90s, and I think our last record came out probably in. In 2000, I think it was. Okay. So that was a while ago, yeah. That was Junior. Junior, yeah. yeah. So then we, we continued to do some shows after that, but... Um, and then we... What happened is that we would sort of reunite when somebody was saying, hey, I'm having a 40th birthday party, or hey, I'm having a 50th birthday party. Would you guys play? And we did. And so I think the last the last of that... The last time we did something was... When when a, one of our friends asked us to play at her fiftieth birthday party at Reggie's oh, okay. in the South Loop, and that was I think probably I'm like, I'm going to say it's maybe five years ago to the date around oh, okay. that time. So okay. yeah, so, so it, it's been five years, and we had a great time practicing for that gig. It was so much fun. We had I think three rehearsals. The first one was like we had a lot of fun remembering the songs or forgetting the songs. The second rehearsal. We drank three bottles of brandy and then <laughs> jammed and, and got really loose. Never it, sounded better. Never sounded better. And then that third rehearsal was all, all serious and it was great. So it was, it, we, it was a, if that's the last thing we do, we had a fantastic time. And, I, you know, we, we don't really run in the same circles anymore. If we did and somebody wanted us to do a show, yeah. it's possible we could do one. So. I, I love the name of your first album, Nonstop Holiday. Nonstop Holiday. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. yeah, no, that's I just I didn't even know where that came from. I think it was probably one of those kind of like mildly sarcastic titles, you know, of yeah. you know, if like if our songs were maybe a little bit about frustration or something and then I don't know. Uh, it just had it had a good uh, kind of uh, Alliterative, non-stop holiday sound to it. So uh, yeah, just it rolled off the tongue. So, <laughs> yeah. So we touched a little bit on Poi Dog. Yeah. How did that come about? How did Poi Dog was? Um, um, they used to come up to Chicago quite a bit. They found a very good audience here in Chicago thanks to Norm Weiner and WXRT, who really fell for the band and plugged them into a lot of shows and put them all over the air um, in their playlist. And so they would come up, and I got to know. Um, Max Crawford, the trumpet player, because he was coming to Lounge Axe, an old fabled club in Lincoln Park. Um, he was coming up to visit. I think he was kind of sweet on the owner, and I got to know him. We get we became very fast friends, and and then and then Frank, the lead singer of Poi Dog, Frank Oral, he happened to also fall in love with a Chicago woman, uh, and was looking for kind of a. A, a different environment t- to be in, and loved Chicago, and and loved uh, this woman, uh, Bridget, and and so he moved up here, and Max came up and moved with him, and they began to sort of put another band together based out of Chicago, uh, and with Chicago musicians, and they had kind of a rough go in Austin. They were they were a big deal, and they had a couple. They did like three records for Sony, and Sony dropped them, and they never they never got the hit record that Sony wanted, and. They were sort of saying, "Well, forget it. Let's 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 start our own thing. Let's start a new thing." I think there were some frustrations within the band down there, and so I just uh, had met Max, and we had 
I got drafted to play a, a sort of a backup band situation, a thrown together backup band situation for a, a great singer called Sid Straw, who sang with the Golden Palominos. And anyway, I I got along with these guys great, and they they were like. I think, you know, we started playing monthly shows and just feeling each other out. And then they decided to make it officially Poi Dog Pondering after about six months and asked me to join in, in early 93, January 93. So, yeah. And then there was a little bit of a breakup of that band. You know, we had our own frustrations and our own kind of uh, failures to hit it big or whatever. Or, you know. When was that, like... That was probably 99 to 2003 or 4 or something. Okay. And it was just, it's a band you never leave, you know. So I, like, I got reshuffled out of the lineup. But eventually I started popping in for one or one gig or a couple songs. Yeah. And then eventually, yeah. <laughs> now it's essentially anybody who's ever been in the band is in the band. Played in, uh, in, in Aurora at uh, the River's Edge, and there was, I don't know how many of us when there's on stage, it's like 17, yeah. 15, 18, yeah, or whatever, you know. 15 or 20 guys in yeah, 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 yeah. So it's everybody, people. everything. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty much all in, yeah. you know. But I'm, the, I'm a big fan of Floyd. Oh, Dog. good, yeah. Uh, I love the band. I mean, but. How would you describe that music? I've always, I mean, when people ask about Poido, I'm like, you know, I don't know. It, it, it's house music. It's rock. It's soul. It's it's folk. It's oh, like yeah. it's 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 a band that is. Um, uh, it's just musically omnivorous. It really kind of is. It's representative of how Frank Oral um, enjoys all types of music, and, and between all of us players, it's we're completely open-minded to all different types of music, and so. There should be really kind of nothing stopping any band that loves a wide variety of music from doing it all, from exploring it all. Poi Dog, I don't think, is a group of dilettantes. It's not a group of people who are just dabbling in whatever weird, funny thing. It's, 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 it's people who really like all types of music. So I have no way to describe it. I, I, can't, I can't figure out. There, there's not one... Thing you can put on it. Yeah, does Frank do most of the writing? Or, or, or yeah, he does. Different? He does. He does most of the writing. You know, it, there are different processes he uses. Sometimes he'll collect bits of stuff that people might have and send in, and and, and he can work a groove around that or something uh, okay. like that. But for the most part, he does the writing and then turns over kind of the arrangements to, to the rest of the band, oh, and, and then and then he'll tighten that up during the editing and mixing right. phase stuff like that so he's uh, the uh, the tools of, of recording and all that are part of the process as well when, when Frank's working and stuff but he, yeah. he's, he's he'll go from a period of hard house music listening to uh, strictly playing uh, a nylon string guitar you know right. and, and, and traipsing around the world with that thing so he's 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 always exploring and he's always yeah. always in, in looking for new stuff. Or, you haven't done much traveling with them. When they go on the road, you... Uh, you know, for the past couple of years, I haven't just because I was working, mm -hmm. you know, more of a traditional hours. But in the in the days when I first joined up in those mid-90s, we, we did a lot of road work. We did uh, some uh, touring as a support act for Dave Matthews for a little bit and that was that was enjoyable to play those big places and experience that kind of life that was nice that was sort of the first time I'd been on that sort of larger sort of scale um, but we did we did a lot of stuff we did a lot of touring we did we did a number of trips around the country and probably time. a good fit with Dave Matthews I would think it seemed to work out pretty well what happens yeah. we have, we have a their monitor guy was also he's from the area oh okay and he was our sound man uh, our monitor man as well and he um, he gave Dave a CD and you know when they were looking for opening bands and uh, Dave was cool with the idea of some doing some runs and he was nice enough to come out and introduce us every night so oh, that really? was cool yeah yeah, cool. yeah it was very cool 
Now, speaking of working regular hours, uh, you've been working uh, with Steve Dow yeah. for, for how long now? Um, we started. I started podcasting with him probably about seven years ago. Then I took a little break when I got a job at MeTV. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so then I took a couple of years off from the podcast and was working in that um, with that company. And then when Steve went back on the air... Uh, he asked me to come and be on the radio, so that was I don't know five years ago, or right. four years ago, and so we've been. And now, now the radio's gone, but we do our podcast every day. Right. So we we do that out of our separate homes, Steve and Brendan Greeley and myself. And How'd you get linked up with Steve originally? Honestly, it was it was, it was VM Music. I was um, I was you know in in my kind of non rock career. I've been doing a lot of, I, I've done a lot of writing, uh, copywriting, advertising and stuff like that, marketing and okay. that was my day gig, freelancing and, you know, working at agencies and, you know, I had some, I've been doing that since probably 93 in one form or another. So I, I was in this, I was in this kind of uh, long distance relationship with a job, <laughs> in other words, I had to drive to, uh, uh, I don't even know, River Woods or some, some place. Yeah. You know? Um, Every day, it's kind of a big hike from Woodstock, and I was yeah. like, "I'm going to treat myself and subscribe to Steve's podcast, so I can listen to it every day." I sure. miss him, and I'd, I'd like, you know, it was right around the time he might have switched over from being a free podcast to a subscription. You were a fan of his from from, from day one, right? From, from day back one, back in the loop days, and yeah, for else. sure. Yeah. WDAI High School, right. you know, blew our minds, and I, you know, yeah, listened me, to me him myself as well. Exactly, yeah. you know what it's like. <laughs> I had heard him. S- trying to come up with a musical idea on GarageBand using one of those sort of built-in loops and stuff. He's like, he had a bit called, Flor- we still do, Floor Idiots. And um, he was thinking, like, I want to write a theme for this. And I'm, he's like playing with his drum beat. And I'm just going, there's this itch in me. I'm going, oh, man, I can do this. I can do this. <laughs> and so, so and, 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 and I think I had sort of sent him a Facebook friend request. And he started talking about me on the show. Like, who's this? Who's Dag Julian? Yeah. <laughs> Pete Zimmerman said, you know, he's producer at the time, and the, the label stuck with me in a kind of a joke. He goes, you don't know the great Dag Julian? So that's, and then, so Steve was mocking Pete for that and mocking me without having met me. And so, like, and I think in, in a way that. True Steve Fashion. Yeah, oh, yeah, yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. To prove, I guess, myself, I think I, just, I wrote a Floridian's theme. Right. There was no request for it, but I knew Pete a little bit, and I just sent this. This, this theme song in unsolicited and it went over very well okay and then and he was that's like, the one we hear today yeah I had to clean it up for the for the for the AM radio I had to, I had to take uh, out the, okay. the yeah. F word but um yeah <laughs> so um so then he was like hey can you do a closing theme and then I think he asked me like hey we got this thing going can you and I think there must have been something in our in our our, our kind of um, rapport that we might have had via emails or whatever um, that and then it also came a time unfortunately that he was sort of purging a large amount of people that he was whose salaries he was paying he was looking to tighten up his operations and I think he just felt something some sort of affinity right. uh, and could recognize that I was a fan and I think I went and introduced myself at one of his live events I brought some CDs and I had a little too, too much to drink just to get the courage up. And I was like, I just wanted to prove to him that I was a real guy, that I had yeah. done real musical things, you know, that I just wasn't some somebody who was, I don't know, an obsessive fan or something. And, and a one-hit wonder? Yeah, right, right, exactly. So so he, he began to, you know, we, we communicated. And then, honestly, and I, th- I think I've told this story before, but it's the real, it's the absolute truth. There was a time when... when when my wife and I were both really underemployed. She was only working part-time, and my freelance stuff had dried up, and we're like, what are we going to do? One of us has to go to the jewel store and get an application. It's, that We have to do that, you know? And we're like, yeah, for sure, that's weird. Okay, and then she left the room, and I looked at my phone, and there was an email from Steve. Hey, uh, are you... Are you working full time I'd like to get you more involved with the podcast and I mean it happened and it, wow. it yeah. happened it really just at the right time so it's I, funny I, how that works I hit yes. reply and that afternoon I went over I, like I, I was just like it was midday and I was like I'm, 
yeah. I can come over now. I went over now, hung out with him for a couple of hours, and then, and then it was there. Basically, I think he yeah. said he wanted to hire me. So we just we hung out and got a vibe, I guess, for each other. It worked out. So it's crazy. Do, now you do the open every month. I do. How does that? Would you keep track of it all all month long as you're doing the shows? You keep. You know, I used to. I used to do that. I used to write something down if somebody said something really funny and write the time down and stuff. But. It was. I felt like it was taking me out of the game a little bit. If I'm waiting for the next quip, I'd rather. I, I just listen to the episodes. I get surprised by something, and then it just it never fails because somehow a couple of quotes come up, and all of a sudden you can thread things together. And 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 I just I just forget about all the things that we do and all the things that we say, and I'm just constantly. Amazed at how funny those guys are, and I tell them every month, I'm like, you guys are so funny. You know, it's a treat to listen to, and and so it just it just happens. You know, it just happens, and I'll, I'll stumble upon something. It's like, oh, that's got to be the closer. You know, whatever. So it just it just happens. It's, it's, there's a there's a there's a freewheeling element to it, and there's also a hyper under the gun holy fuck it's due tomorrow kind of yeah. element so, yeah. sorry to swear but that's what it's, that's yeah. what it's like so yeah. yeah so you know based on that you can get some great work done yeah. a deadline is a great thing for a writer yeah. you know so yeah. I there's always, one other avenue that you're out there with Expo 76 yeah yeah how yeah long you been, how long you been that's that? that's that's a 10 year old band that's a cover band and that's that's um, the concept on that is just for my whole sort of musical career, one of my little either super uh, annoying traits or enjoyable campfire slash party tricks is that I've yeah. memorized a lot of songs. Yeah. You know, I don't have any right. real world skills, but I have been able to file right. a lot of songs away. And I just thought I I would I would be talking with um, with our keyboard player Kenny, who's been a friend of mine and a label boss of mine and a bandmate of mine in different situations for many many years, and I was just like, man, if we could if we could form a cover band that plays the stuff that we love, and it's again it goes back to that idea of all sorts of genres, all sorts of like, that it's not just going to be focused on one thing. We can pluck something. From, you know, a show tune or we can pluck you know some you know, a punk rock tune or something and it all is going to make sense because we care about it all and we love it all mm-hmm. and if, if we can form a band where we, we don't want to you know put a gun in our mouths because we played some song we detest for the millionth time it's it's truly based on uh, on songs that I just love mm-hmm. and, and never get tired of and 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 other guy, uh, the other guys obviously bring in songs and sing songs, but I was just like, I, I, there's a ton of songs I just love, I've been obsessed with, and it's made it super easy for me to just keep playing. And we 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 add new songs all the time, but it's really the the the, the love that we have, and it's also it's 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 really kind of a tribute to um, when we were all kids. Um, if you, I've got a, I've got a huge collection of the old uh, WLS and WCFL surveys. You know the oh, top sure, forty, sure. and if you look at any one of those and you look at the playlist, oh, yeah. what it was like in the seventies, yeah. <laughs> there was no there was no separation. It was like an R and B song, mm-hmm. a, right. a, 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 a glam rock song, right. a country rock song, right. a, a disco song. Yeah. A, you know, like a, like a or a new wave song when the time got right, right. for that. Right. An, a, a, a proggy kind of song. It was all there together, and it, right. and, it, and it kind of listening to it, no one ever said, no one ever questioned. How, right. you, yeah. how can you play Charlie Daniels yeah. after Stevie Wonder? You know, it's like that's a, it. Just I think it just yeah. created yeah. something in in people of that of that generation that just like they yeah. were open to stuff. So that's it was okay. like in a way, it was really a peak uh, of that kind of thing. The productions were great, and the songs were great, and and so we grew up listening with those kind of ears. So these things 
makes sense. So it's kind of a, according to Dag Julin. Uh, kind of. Yeah. A bit, yeah, yeah, you know. Kind of taking the garage band out to the public. Yeah. Well, the, the one, uh, the, I've always wanted to detail like what, what the things that I was basing the band on. And I've mentioned NRBQ before. They were a band that when I first was ready enough to hear them, I recognized the, the, the swing in their backbeat and the, the wide range of their, their musical you know, influences and vocabulary. I, I latched onto that and loved it. So it was them. And then I hear, then the Hamburg era Beatles, you know, like not that I saw them, right. but I heard, the, I, you know, read so much about their mythology, about how they just dicked around on stage mm-hmm. and, they, and they, they played, they churned out like hours and hours of songs and right. it, was, it was all this, you know, from rockabilly to, right. you know, a lot novelty of rockabilly, songs. Yes. Crazy stuff. And then when I was a kid, um, my parents had these live records by Trini Lopez at like PJs, <laughs> sure. yeah. and and it, and and growing up and listening to those records and watching like the Dick Van Dyke show when they'd have everybody over at the house and they'd put on a show and they'd do a party and everybody was playing like that whole sort of loose live vibe right. Right. was uh, was big for me and so I like that that all kind of sunk in with me and and so Expo is kind of the uh, the kind of regurgitation of all that. It's it's this. It's it, it's it's definitely a, it's a super loose environment, uh, but it's it's supported. I feel by really tight playing. You know, tremendous humor from all of us. Great rapport. All the guys in the band. They didn't know each other, but I knew them in in different ways. And we were all we're all the same age. We all had the same hairline. And, we all, <laughs> <laughs> and there was just and we all had the same kind of. Uh, person. So you couldn't fit in this. Band. No, yeah, you, know, you couldn't be in the band. Yeah, 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 I'm right there. Right. But um, <laughs> so everybody got it right away. I was like, look, I, I, I wrote, I had these long conversations on the phone. I'm like, you gotta, I got this concept for a band. And at the time, my my wife was like, you do not need to be in another band. Sir. <laughs> yeah, you're already yeah, driving yeah, forty yeah, minutes, you know, right. forty miles, <laughs> sixty miles, whatever. You're already missing out on enough. And I'm yeah. just like, you gotta trust me on this. And it's worked out. Wonderfully, right. you know, it's it's just a great experience. And you do most of your work with uh, your performing with Expo, right? That's most the one that shows. yeah. We have residencies yeah. every month. We have we have gigs that we play. We play Simon's every month. Simon's every month. Fitzgerald's every month. And then there are other places we're starting to develop up north in Highwood. And right. you know, we have a private party. We just got through doing a couple of weddings. You know, people. People right. ask us to do a wedding. We're like, great, that's fantastic. But you got to understand, we do what we do. We don't do, right. and I want to tell you this right up front, like we don't do like celebration or the chicken dance. We just, we yeah. don't know okay. those songs. <laughs> no, no. You know, we could fake our way through that. But. So I'm like, if you guys are cool with that, then we'll we'll come out and play. And, and people are always cool. They And that's the reason they usually ask us is because they respond to that kind of far-flung, whatever, you know, set list that we have, so... Yeah. So, so tell me quickly about 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 some plays and films and stuff that you've got some you've got some music in. I have, yeah. I've, I've, and TV TV shows or. Um, yeah, some some of the slug stuff landed on some. Oh, some on of the some slug t- stuff too. Landed okay. on TV shows, and that's been great. I mean, it continues to you know. Yeah. Keep me in you know the the, the low, three figures you know. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that there was a you know. Um, my key, my friend Kenny, who's our keyboard player at Expo, he also runs Pravda Records, who signed the Slugs, and it, it right. ministers music for tons of people, and got a bunch of stuff on TV, and that's great. So I've had that. I've, I've, um, I have friends in in the theatrical world, and they've asked me to write music. I've written sort of uh, experimental music for a play about. You know, crystal meth addiction, and then I wrote some '80s music for a play just a, a couple of months ago. Uh, and so yeah, it's it's. Um, I would I want to do more of that. You know, I want to try to expand that. So so obviously you feel that this music, that, like the slug music, that is in some of the some of the shows or whatever. Yeah, you still, you feel it's still relevant today. Well, I mean, it, it's it's. It was it it was in the early days of like the WB or the CW whatever it was right. like Party of Five or Dawson's right. Creek when okay. those things were happening, they they everybody was gobbling up music for those right. shows. So they, I got lucky on a couple of numbers, and there's some some little bits of that have ended up on MTV shows, and I don't know, 
Well, see, I, I've, always, I've always had this theory. <laughs> this is just a theory, my own theory. But, but that there's a resurgence of, of music every 20 years. I mean, in the 80s, the, the Motown music came back. And, yeah. and, and, and then in the 90s, the 70s stuff. You know, and, and a lot of... Uh, in I, the I, 70s, everybody was watching Happy Days. They were watching the 50s and stuff right, like that. Right, you're know. right, right. So I just did a show. Um, uh, Sunshine Boys just played at DePaul University. Uh, DePaul, uh, they had like a humanities fest, which was celebrating 50 years of Woodstock. And so they had some artists playing some songs from, from Woodstock. And they had a couple of people, like, they had, um, uh, was it uh, Geraldo Velez, who was Jimi Hendrix's conga player. He was out there oh. talking and jamming with us as we did the Woodstock. And then they had, a, um, I believe his name is Danny... Oh, I forgot his name. That's killing me. But he's a, he was the lead singer of Sha Na Na. I was just going to say, uh, okay. for, for some reason... Forster was, or for... Yeah, some, some, yeah he was... Or for, no, okay. it, it, he, was, he was there. He's gone into a really interesting career in, in um, forensic pathology or pathological forensic, oh, yeah. whatever it is. But anyway, so but I was... Oh, sure. and, and so, so there, there is. Yeah, I was thinking about years, that myself. Yeah. 20, yeah <laughs> Guys, yeah, that's an amazing funny. thing. Shana Na played Woodstock, and it was yeah. a, it, it yeah. was the most punk rock thing of all time. Right? Yeah, you know, it was great. Yeah. It was super cool to watch like old films of him up there at Woodstock and doing it. And we had to after the after the show, we were talking. We just said, "You guys invented punk rock." Yeah. All righty. Well, where uh, you know what? I don't. I don't even know. I usually we usually end our podcast and say, "Well, where can we find you?" But we can find you like all over the place. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Swing a dead cat. Is there a, web, yeah. is there a website though? Yeah, there's a few of them. Yeah, the tail. A, is there yeah. A tail? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, sunshineboys.net, dogjulin.com, that's not updated. There's expo76.com, toydogpondering.com, doll.com. Yeah. Uh, what else am I doing? All the Facebooks. <laughs> Facebook, all the, all the Twitter, places. all that stuff. Where are you on Twitter? At Dog Julian. Dog Julian. Also, I'm also more show stuff on Dog Doll Cast. One word. So okay. yeah, or Sunshine Boys are on there too. Okay. okay. When's uh, when's the Sunshine Boys uh, new album? We're looking at May first. The album okay. is called Work and Love, and we feel that a, the workers' holiday of May Day is a good time to put it out. Yeah. So yeah. that's and we're. We're lining up all the videos and promotional elements before that, so we're giving ourselves a lot of time. So Good. looking at May 1st. You did real well with that first one. So yeah, sure thanks. Right. Thanks so much, man. Good luck with it. Thank you. Good. Thanks for making a drive up here, guys. Oh, that's right. Thank, oh, thank, thanks for coming and meeting us, and, uh, and yeah. uh, we enjoyed having you out here. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. Man. Nice. Thank you. Thanks. Wow, Ray, that was uh, that we did. Doc Julian is surely uh, an interesting fellow, isn't he? He sure is. I can't believe he runs down here from Woodstock every evening just to have a pint. <laughs> well, uh, if, if it's good, then you, you travel a long distance for that. It is. It's a nice place. A very nice place. That was a great interview. He was a lot of fun. Yeah, very talented guy as well. Quite talented. Very busy. He's busy. With, he's got a lot of bands that he's in. Yes, he is. Yes, he does. As well as the podcast with Steve Dahl. Right. Right. It was uh, it was fun, uh, fun talking to Doc and uh, getting some insight into, into what he does. And uh, hope everybody enjoyed it. Make sure everybody's uh, checking us out uh, on Facebook, our uh, on our website, and uh, make sure you listen to the Road to Rock Radio .net every Monday at six o'clock. They feature one of our podcasts. And check out the Illinois Rock and Roll Museum on Route sixty six. All right, thank you for listening. Talk to you soon. Bye.